Well, good morning, my friends, and uh, thank you for joining us here on this uh, Thursday morning edition of Real Talk. And, and thanks for hanging out. That was Ayla Brooke and the sound men that you were just hearing there. We're super excited to have the uh, Edmonton, what, what would they call themselves? Maybe a folk roots band? Uh, I don't know what they call themselves. They can pure rock and roll. I'll tell you that much as well. Ayla Brooke uh, made the generous offer a while back to donate their music. Uh, to what we call the intro and the extra of Real Talk every single morning. And, and on mornings like this, where, where we have a little glitch out of the gates, but it's not a big deal, because here we are independently pushing out what I think is maybe already Western Canada's most listened to talk show, at least based on the iTunes charts. We know that pressure is low because you know what's coming. You know, if YouTube gives us a little glitch, it's not a big deal. This is the new landscape. So we start copacetic listening to Ayla Brook and the Soundman. Desolation Sounds is the album that that tune is from, and I encourage you uh, to check it out. Coming up in just a few moments, we're very excited. This will be his, obviously, first appearance on Real Talk. He is the youngest chief in the history of of the Enoch Cree First Nation, and in January, uh, coming up on a year ago, uh, Billy Morin was named Grand Chief of Treaty 6. He's going to be joining us momentarily. We're also going to be talking to uh, uh, Dr. Shazma Mathani this morning, an ER physician out of the Royal Alexandra Hospital and the Stollery Children's Hospital in Edmonton, and a woman... Uh, a remarkable woman. She has been battling cancer for five years. She's been kicking cancer's ass is what she's been doing. Uh, but it's her social media activity. It's her perspective. It's her Instagram posts, I think, that have caused so many people to really fall in a beautiful platonic love with Julie Rohr. And Julie Rohr will be joining us this morning. We're also going to be taking on a story being reported by the CBC. Some confidential audio recordings have surfaced that paint a concerning picture of the relationship between Alberta's Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Dina Hinshaw, and Alberta's Health Ministry, uh, Tyler Shandro, Minister Shandro, and Premier Jason Kenney. Not everybody's thrilled about the recordings being released, and, and I'm not just talking about the government. As a matter of fact, some apolitical, or let me say nonpartisan political strategists whose opinions I respect a lot this morning are saying, this isn't cool at all. They're saying this actually hurts the governance of the province of Alberta. So we may take a bit of a different angle on that story this morning, but still remarkable reporting by the CBC team of Jenny Russell and Charles Rusnell. The credit there where it's deserved. Before we get to Grand Chief Morin, we want to let you know who has joined us on this journey in a presenting sponsor role. We're so grateful to have the team at Bitcoin Solutions making sure that we are here doing what we do best every single morning. You may have seen over the weekend, Bitcoin is actually trading at its highest levels in history. It's been a remarkable few years for Bitcoin. As a matter of fact, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but I was crunching some numbers during the last American presidential election back on November 3rd. You know, if you would have bought Bitcoin the day that President Donald Trump won, and if you would have sold it on the day that President-elect Joe Biden won, you would have, well, seen a 750% increase. If you're looking for a, a safe, reputable, local, and easy way to buy or sell Bitcoin, check out Bitcoin Solutions, and you can see uh, their website, the link there, and their logo on our website under the sponsor link at ryanjesperson.com. All right, let's get this thing rolling here. Okay, we're going to go straight into a, typically we would have an opener. Doesn't matter. Sam, just, it's all good, dude. This is, here's, here's the thing. We're doing a show. Yesterday we had some technical difficulties. I'm just, this is real talk, so let me keep it real for a second. Obviously this blows at the beginning of a show to start like this, right? Mm -hmm. Just, the host gets a little bit rattled, right? Yesterday a couple people said, why didn't you call Drew Barnes out on the one thing he said about masks? And you want to know the truth? The truth is that I was so rattled by the technical difficulties we were experiencing. The truth, I didn't even hear him say it, okay? When you see the calm, cool, collected face of a host like this who's been hosting television and radio broadcasts for 15 years, sometimes inside it's a raging wildfire. It's chaos. And that was yesterday and this morning starting a little weird as well, but we're not rattled. We're going to do a good show today and it's all good. Sam is chill. I am chill. We have hot coffees in front of us. Grand Chief Morin's ready to go. Do we have the opener teed up? Are we set to go? All right. Well, let's roll it. Put a lot of work into it. So here it is. 
Real Talk starts now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. All right, I've been looking forward to this conversation uh, for a long time, and uh, it, it gives me real pleasure uh, to introduce a person who I can consider to be a personal friend. I don't know him as well as I'd like, and, and let's change that uh, starting now. You know what? He's, he, he's uh, at the age of, of 28 back in 2015. Uh, he was elected as the youngest chief in his nation, Enoch Cree Nation's history. And during his tenure from 2015 to present, he's focused on economic and capital investment. He secured more than $200 million in external investment uh, for his relatively small 2,500-person community just west of Edmonton. Furthermore, he leads a revitalization of Cree language and culture in his nation as a top priority. He's a remarkable individual. If you don't uh, believe me or you don't know already, you're about to find out in this conversation as, as we welcome it. And it's a great honor. Uh, the Grand Chief of Treaty 6, William Billy Morin. Grand Chief, welcome to Real Talk and, and thanks for making time for us this morning, my friend. Hey, good morning, Mio Kixipai Orion. Uh, you you had uh, graciously offered to join us in studio, and I was really looking forward to this in studio conversation. But obviously, provincial health directives have have prompted both yourself, your office, and our team here to 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 make sure that we make the appropriate adjustments and show leadership on that front, Grand Chief. With regards to the the COVID implications on Enoch Cree Nation or on Indigenous First Nations in Treaty Six. What's maybe not seeing top bill reporting? What's not seeing front page coverage that really is presenting some challenges for members of your community? I think the top challenge right now, Ryan, is, is, is kind of access to testing. So we were promised, um, maybe promise is too strong of a word, but, um, you know, we were more or less guaranteed, I would say, uh, access to, to testing and um uh, uh, what you call uh, the real-time testing or the the uh, rapid response testing, and you know, for our nations, um, you, you can think of First Nations as 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 really big, two thousand plus. My my nation's a two thousand five hundred person family, and interaction, as much as we try to really really send that message, is really tough to do on the nation, and and it's it's tough to police on the nation. I mean, we struggle with policing, we struggle with bylaws, we struggle with enforcement. On First Nations, I mean, Enoch's one of the more luckier ones, but, um, you know, it, it, it's really been that kind of struggle to, to for immediate services on the nation, given the remoteness. I mean, Enoch itself is, again, I would say one of the luckier ones, given we're so close to the city. But, you know, there's huge outbreaks right now in Musquachis, um for a roughly 10,000 person uh, community. Uh, they're up at over 100, as uh, last I understood. Uh, Saddle Lake was experiencing somewhere around a hundred person outbreak and, you know, just getting those supplies, getting those tests into the nation has proven difficult. Grand Chief Moore, do you have a, I mean, have you in, in consultation with, with uh, your, your fellow community leaders or, or in the work that you've been doing, have you, do you think come up with what you think might be a solution to address some of the problems that you've just identified? Yeah, it's always a lobby effort. So yesterday I had 17 chiefs on a Zoom call with uh, Minister Miller. And uh, quite frankly, um, just they just seem to be making it up as they go along for for getting these supplies into the nations. I mean, we got to be I got to say, I, I am very grateful for the extra uh, funding that goes into First Nations because it, it, it does at the end of the day help. You know, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of a success story um, for First Nations early on during the first wave, which was uh, border security. So, you know, we do uh, consider ourselves nations. Um, those highways and those lines and access to our nations, uh, we took the extra step of actually having those border security. So here in Enoch Cree Nation, you couldn't enter without a pass uh, right next to the city of Edmonton um, and a registration. And that really seemed to help, but uh, border security wasn't free. Um, and just recently, um, the federal government announced about $19 million in border security for First Nations uh, for the province of Alberta. So, so, you know, there, there are good things happening. It just seems like, just like everybody else in every other jurisdiction, we kind of make it up as we go along, quite frankly. So that's uh, obviously from a, from a, a leadership perspective, stressful, and, and I'm sure you'd rather be able to get ahead of some of these challenges and have policies in place and, and do a lot of planning ahead of time. I know we're going to talk about how you've approached attracting external investment and those types of things. I know that that kind of stuff comes with more of a long-term kind of a tactical approach, when it comes to healthcare provision, 
uh, Grand Chief Morin, the last time you and I spoke right at the end of the interview when we had run out of time, uh, which, by the way, doesn't happen on this show now. This is one of the beautiful things about it. But you you touched on uh, basically indigenous sovereignty, uh, sovereignty in the context of health care provision. And we ran out of time before we could really dig into it. But I'd love to get into it with you now. What does that look like? So immediately what it looks like is um, uh, recently in the news, uh, maybe some people have seen it. It was a small story done. Um, the provincial government put out an RFP for uh, chartered surgical facilities. And, um, you know, this is one that I asked the previous government about, um, you know, can we can we get into the health field? I mean, I need to diversify my economy, too, here. And, you know, even as a proud Albertan, I, I am the chief of Enoch and I am Cree, uh, Cree First Nation first, but I am a proud Albertan. And, you know, just as a as a young person, as, as somebody who's interested in, in society and in politics and and and, and government, um, you know, as an Albertan, you, you kind of just wonder what's can we can we kind of stop the insanity and spending billions and billions of dollars throwing money down the, the drain? Well, no, that's the wrong way, way to put it. Just it just seems like there's it's insanity when it comes to healthcare. So, you know, we do really want to just push our sovereignty into creating more efficiencies into the healthcare system and do things that maybe necessarily the bureaucracy or the Canadian law um, doesn't really allow for uh, when it comes to pilot projects in healthcare. So the first one you'll see, um, we'll go through an RFP here with the government and we're pretty confident we're gonna get the center of excellence idea off the ground here in an announcement next year soon uh, for a chartered surgical facility. But really looking at health as, you know, can we attract investors like Mayo Clinic and Cleveland Clinic? Um, can we attract uh, things like that uh, uh, partnerships with the U of A for more research with indigenous medicines and indigenous healing, and quite frankly, even world healing with Eastern medicine. Can we create this space in Enoch Cree Nation right next to the city of Edmonton and not have the bureaucracy br uh, break us down with, with creating efficiencies in the healthcare system? So at a high level, that's, that's kind of the vision. Have you un undertaken, uh, you know, significant or what you, what you might call meaningful conversations. And by meaningful, I mean uh, conversations that have the potential to move the ball down the field in the context. I mean, one of the things you just identified, you identified a, a bunch, uh, bringing in surgical facilities, attracting research opportunities. I mean, these are all amazing. And, and as if I need to tell you, uh, Grand Chief would come with real economic opportunities as well. Uh, but, but the idea of integrating indigenous medicine from either a research standpoint or uh, a health service provision standpoint and other Eastern medicines, I think more and more, I would get the sense that more and more people even outside of, of your nation would probably have a real interest in learning more about that. And we know that typically, I would never describe the medical profession as stodgy, uh, but I do know having sat around a table with, with, with doctors, or let me say physicians and surgeons, and chiropractors, as an example, that not everybody always sees along the same lines. Never mind acupuncturists, never mind holistic physicians. You get the point I'm getting at. There's a spectrum when it comes to what people, you know, look to in traditional medicine uh, from some cultures versus so-called traditional medicine from other cultures. You think the general population might have an appetite for this? And, and, and what do you think the potential might look like for traditional indigenous medicine available to the general population? Well, um, uh, I guess, I guess a personal side um, where, where, where my mind goes first is uh, my dad passed away of cancer in 2013. And, uh, you know, in May he was given kind of the prognosis that, uh, you know, you have, a, you have 12 months to live and he had, um, he lasted uh, 10 months. And uh, the doctor said at that point, you know, uh, we're going to go, it's too late for kind of uh, uh, chemotherapy. We're going to try a little bit of radiation, but it didn't work. And uh, they really encouraged him um, to try uh, traditional indigenous medicine through through our, our, our family. And um, I got to say, um, that one was a lot more, it, it's tough to describe, but it was a lot more effective than the radiation. And it was a lot more comforting. And it, brought, it, it actually, it, it brought more healing, I would say, to uh, my mom too, who had to walk down that uh, that road with him for for ten months, and so it was it was a lot more, as you put it, holistic um, in healing and, and adding that extra aspect to healthcare. So you know, you, I uh, I had some conversations with the Cancer Foundation, and um, you know, I do get really encouraged about creating these spaces and these dialogues. I think they're really preliminary. 
um, when it comes to Indigenous medicine, integrating it with, uh, you know, public medicine and, and, and the Alberta healthcare system. I think it's really in its infancy, but I see no reason um, why these, these, these synergies can't be, uh, 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 they can't take big steps forward in the immediate future. Now, from an Indigenous perspective, though, that is uh, something I got to admit that I'm not an Indigenous doctor. And uh, we're, le we're using that term loosely. So there's a lot of traditional aspects of this that have to be uh, carefully thought out through protocol and through language and through culture that you can't just take a, a piece of sweetgrass behind me and say you're healing somebody. Right. It, it, we don't want to make it, um, you know, kind of cheap and, and um, not encompassing with the spirituality aspect of it. So, you know, that's really something where I'm going to have to rely upon uh, elders and real elders, quite frankly, uh, ones who are not out to kind of uh, exploit this system. Uh, but I really just want to tackle something really new and, and give the world uh, something something back in healthcare that, that Indigenous people have uh, a gift to give. And I really think that this conversation is is, is warranted and it'll, it'll, it'll happen, but it'll be really difficult from our perspective. But uh, now's the time. I, I think, long what, story what, short, Ryan, I think, it, it, yeah, what, I, I, I think there is that yearning even from non-Indigenous people to participate in this. What, what would make the, when you say the, the conversation would be difficult, what, what would make it most difficult? So what would make it most difficult um, is is there is still this kind of inherent distrust, broadly speaking, between Indigenous people and Canadians. And there are Indigenous people out there who are still hurt and do not want to share, do not feel trusting in sharing these things. And uh, you got to kind of create a space and take it step by step for them to feel comfortable because they are truly, really, really special people who have gifts to give and share with our people and everybody else, quite frankly, but I don't want them feeling uncomfortable. I don't want them feeling like uh, they take a step forward and somebody exploits them like a government bureaucracy or a business person or an investor who's looking to make a quick buck. Yeah. Um, so it's going to take a little bit of while and take a little bit of thought and how to enroll Indigenous medicine out to the broader public. Well, and I think one of the key words of the conversation that we're having, uh, Grand Chief, is sovereignty, right? So if you're talking about Indigenous sovereignty in healthcare, I mean, if you, you know, one of the ways to, to, I think, at least to a certain degree, eliminate opportunities for exploitation is to ensure that sovereignty is real and meaningful, right? Uh, I want to circle back on something you said. It, it was just a quick comment, and, and I, I never want to be guilty of reading too much into something, but what did you mean when you said you want to consult with elders and then you clarified, you said real elders. Uh, I, I don't want to, you know, I mean, I don't want to maybe drank, uh, drag this, this Wet'suwet'en um, issue in, in, into this conversation if it doesn't fit. Uh, but doesn't it feel like a lifetime ago, Grand Chief, that we were talking about railway blockades and, and, and all these types of things? And, and, and many Canadians, non-Indigenous Canadians, for the first time, we're learning a little bit about the difference between elected leadership and hereditary leadership. Is that what you're alluding to? Yeah, broadly speaking, yes. Uh, just quickly on Wet'suwet'en, that does feel like a long time ago. And, uh, you know, I was talking with Chiefs really, really quick yesterday and, you know, how the Mi'kmaq just bought all the lobster uh, fisheries. And I was like, you know what? Maybe there's a story to tell. And when it comes to Bill 1 and how our people are really offended, justifiably, uh, maybe we just buy the railroads. And, uh, you know, next time there's a protest or something to add, we actually own them and we have more say over it. So that's that was an interesting conversation yesterday, just like the big mop. Man. But anyways, Ryan, uh, yeah, great question. That's that's a struggle. Um, I think the word elder is 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 thrown around too loosely. And, it, you know, even from an indigenous perspective, most people would agree. So, you know, when you think of an elder, you think of somebody who's really, really, um, for lack of a better word, old is a senior. Um, you know, they have this white hair and they say opening prayers. And uh, that's not truly what an elder is. Um, it's even a tough conversation in our community where we define elder by age and it's 60 and uh, they get certain, um, they get some of their bills paid for, they get a little bit of extra assistance from our social programs and they call themselves elders uh, at 60. But we're really trying to evolve away from that and use, again, kind of the Nehiao Cree perspective and Kiteak is the word for uh, older person who earns respect in the nation. And if you're an elder on a First Nation, you don't have to say you are. Um, if you say you are, I don't think you're an elder. I mean, if you if you give yourself that label, are you expecting? So, again, from the indigenous perspective, um, we're kind of struggling too with what an actual elder is, and it's something that's really not defined too much on paper. 
and more about the just stature, broadly speaking, when it comes to uh, Indigenous perspectives on recognizing um, pipe holders, um, but recognizing even different types of uh, circumstances that call for uh, or older people perspectives. I mean, you can actually be a pipe holder when you're three years old or born into it. Uh, does that necessarily make you an elder? Um, again, that's really tough to define. So um, circling back to the medicine aspect, um, there's few and far between elders or older people that I would engage, but there's really key ones across the province that are not even in my nation that need to be a part of this uh, this talk because when I talk about healthcare and, and incorporating that into the public system or giving a gift back to the world here in Enoch Cree Nation, it's not just Enoch giving back, it's all of Treaty 6. It's all of the 45 First Nations in Alberta that have something to give back. And, um, you know, again, we'll have to take it step by step and, and earn those really true people who have used those gifts in the right way and not ones who just say they're 60 for the fact of saying they're 60 and have to burn sweet grass. It's it's really interesting insight. Insight. Uh, if if you're just tuning in right now, it's uh, Grand Chief Billy Morin joining us. Grand Chief of Treaty Six, uh, the youngest elected chief in the history of Enoch uh, Cree Nation. I mean, you, you're you're elected in 2015, like we said, five years ago at the age of 28. Uh, I'm not surprised. And, and by the way, some of the things that you've accomplished, and I want to talk about the investment in natural gas in just a moment to follow up on that story that you and I last talked about, I think two months ago. Uh, but but uh, I mean, of course, you're going to have an interesting perspective on what leadership looks like. Um, how would you characterize now as a as a 30, 32 or 33 year old man? Uh, you know, that, that obviously is, is not just leading his nation, which in itself is a huge responsibility, uh, but chosen now coming up on the one year anniversary uh, as as Grand Chief of, of Treaty 6. How, how would you characterize your leadership or maybe even the leadership of of your fellow community, uh, First Nation leaders uh, within your age demographic or bracket versus leadership of generations before in the context of developing opportunities, pursuing opportunities for outside investment, reconsidering structures of things like policing and healthcare provision? I mean, we've talked about judicial sovereignty on First Nations for for decades in the province of Alberta, not that we've seen a lot of progress on that file, but it's not a new idea. What changes with young leadership like yours? Yeah, uh, I really look up to people actually outside of this province, people like Clarence Louis, um, uh, people like Darcy Barron, Saskatchewan, um, the Mi'kmaq leader who actually just uh, uh, bought the, the fisheries there for a billion dollars, uh, um, Terry Paul in, in, in uh, member two, and these were really pro-business leaders. Um, at the end of the day, I sit on through this the, the seats that I have. I'm very fortunate as a young person to get to these tables. And uh, one of the quotes that was given to me was, uh, the best relationship with any government is actually a business relationship. And you know, I, I am really actually tired of going to tables and, and, and going with the uh, uh, older people who have been in kind of indigenous leadership. And, and we seem to be having the same conversations for like 30 or 40 years banging our heads against the wall. Like you said, there's there's so many great ideas out there, but I think this younger generation of leadership and you're seeing even more of them being elected is, is they're really just doers. And they've been kind of educated uh, at the U of A, the University of Lethbridge in Calgary and, and uh, broadly, and they're coming home to the nation, the nations, you know, I think of Siksika uh, and Chief Profit. I don't know him that well, but he has a, a master's degree from, from Texas. He actually has a very Texas uh, 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 accent. Um, you know, and so I think of some of the the indigenous leaders who are coming up now and who are younger are really just doers. They're they're tired of the old conversations and they're willing to take risks and uh, kind of play in both areas. And then when you alluded in your opening on um, uh, language and culture, I, I really think they're just putting in the work to mm -hmm. to to kind of pause and go back to those special places with real elders mm -hmm. and learn and bring that and kind of again just walk down the same path of not selling out your nation, but agreeing to 10 year grant agreements and increasing your funding uh, despite, uh, and not doing the same old thing and signing the same old three year agreements. I mean, man, I get in trouble for my partnerships with government all day long, but um, I think most people don't argue with the results I get from my, even from my own nation. So uh, the younger leadership are just more educated. They're more doers, they're more practical. They, um, can walk in two worlds. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I guess it's just a natural evolution of over time um, when nations started investing in, in long-term education and, 
uh, hopefully you can start seeing results in that regard, like the Mi'kmaq deals, or maybe we buy a railroad, and maybe you'd have to buy things like Cascade, because those things never really happen. It's it's wild to hear somebody, I mean, you think of the potential of what you could accomplish, and you think of and, and the employment potential, and you think of the economic uh, ramifications, you know, you say, maybe we'll just buy the railroad, and, and knowing you a little bit, I know that you're not being facetious. I know that you're being serious. Uh, last time that we spoke, you you had just basically, and I'm sure that you'll defer some of the credit uh, to to some of your colleagues in leadership, <laughs> but uh, you are the grand chief of Treaty 6, and, and I know that the investment of $93 million into that Cascade power plant, that natural gas plant near Edson, was, was a big step forward for you, not just from an investment standpoint, but also in a government partnership uh, standpoint. What have you seen in, in the eight weeks, or maybe let's call it the 10 weeks, uh, since that investment was made public, what have you seen with regards to to some of the spin off benefits? Whether it's morale in the community, whether it's interest from other potential investors, how is that playing out? Yeah, so um, I think the biggest benefits has been to the other First Nations themselves. Uh, Enoch Cree Nation, being so close to the city, has already looked like as an economic leader amongst First Nations. But for the Alexis, Nakoda, and Backwoods Energy Company, um, they actually are getting more of the contracts in, in, in this economic corridor that we call Yellowhead Highway. And, uh, you know, I went out there for another groundbreaking ceremony, and it was only Alexis uh, heavy earth equipment uh, clearing that site. And so the economic benefits, not to just Enoch Green Nation, but it, it was really awesome to... Oh, I'm getting a, a team's call there. <laughs> it was, it's really awesome to see. Um, it's just really awesome to see other First Nations uh, get out of their own way, quite frankly, and and put themselves at these tables. So Alexis is probably doing what I'm told over $100 million of construction and energy work in this little corridor alone. Um, and, you know, we, we brought Ochis to the table who does who has an untold story of their own gas company already established. They own a casino in Red Deer. And uh, it's not an indigenous uh, host nation gaming casino, but, you know, there's really these untold stories of indigenous communities already thriving and they're taking those next steps. Um, with all due respect to my my other counterpart at Paul Band, um, they struggle a little bit more with some of the social aspects and they haven't taken steps forward as much as Enoch or Ochis or Alexis. But we felt it necessary to create that space for them and uh, to kind of blaze the trail and, and pull them along and, and expose them to these tables. So, you know, I really look forward to somebody like the Paul First Nation, who is located on Lake Wobman, one of the best lakes around Edmonton, where, you know, we hang out at the summertime. They have a great piece of property there undeveloped. And if they can expose themselves to investors and to capital investment, they can do something really special out there at Wobman as well. So um, that's been kind of the, the high level um, benefits in the last eight weeks. You know, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, uh, the next conversation with you, Grand Chief, which, you know, probably in a few months or something along those lines. But but I'm also looking forward to talking to you in 20 years. You know, I'm looking forward to seeing where your leadership journey goes. I'm looking forward to seeing when uh, some of these seeds that you're planting uh, or, or, or even some of them that you're just thinking about germinating right now. Um, as those develop and then we see the generational impact. I mean, you know, you, you know, uh, you talk about Paul Band and some of the social challenges that have been well publicized in the news. I mean, uh, I guess we do have time to get into this a little bit, but I guess the point I'm just going to make is when communities and when people see hope and see opportunity and see promise and and are motivated by some of the factors that would motivate anybody, um, the social impact we know uh, can be huge, but that's not the type of thing that happens overnight. Obviously, you know that. Yeah, I, you know, one of my things being chief is, is I don't know actually how long I'm going to be chief for. Um, you know, I'm, I'm here for the next year and a half in Enoch Cree Nation. And uh, quite frankly, at 33, I'm already a, a seven-year veteran of, of, of leadership. And uh, I do get a little bit worried about what's next. I mean, like any any leader, you kind of wonder if if you if you take off, uh, what's going to happen. So, you know, again, for for our nation, um, what really gives me hope is uh, establishing this youth council we have. And there's seven of eight of them are actually young women, uh, ages 14 to 20, 27. And in our ways, uh, you know, my sons are actually the seventh generation of leadership since treaty. And in kind of the traditional aspects of, of, of Nahal perspective and prophecies, the first generations of leadership are defined by men. And the next seven generations of leadership will actually be defined by women. And you kind of seeing that come true with even Enoch Cree Nation, uh, with other First Nations. 
and uh, you know, with with kind of the national perspective on women taking a, a, a leadership role in uh, people like Pam Palmer being very, very vocal, uh, Missing and Murdered Women is a project that, um, of course, I just support at the end of the day. You know, even locally, I, I look to the, the renaming of the wards. That was a 100% Indigenous women-led project. And, um, you know, you, you were just hitting on hope and what's next for First Nations. I, I really just want to say that I think women are going to be at the forefront of Indigenous leadership for a long time to come and very, very soon. Well, I'd, I'd like to pitch to you uh, an assignment, uh, Grand Chief, and maybe you could help me in producing. I'm envisioning a roundtable uh, conversation when we can gather people back here in studio. That'll, that'll excite me greatly, but I'd love if you could help me uh, maybe maybe recruit three of the women that are serving on that youth council, and maybe we could have a real meaningful, uh, long-flowing uh, type conversation here in the Real Talk studio down the line. That, I mean, that I think would be meaningful to a lot of people and enlightening for many of us. Thank you so I know you've, we've got to let you go. Uh, I want to talk about your future political career. You say you don't know how long you'll be chief. I suspect you're going to be in positions of leadership for quite some time. I wouldn't be surprised to see your name on a on a ballot. Uh, I won't put you in that position right now, but maybe you and I can talk about that later. Grand Chief Billy Morin, uh, hi, hi, and thank you very much for joining us this morning. It means a lot to have you here in our first week. Yeah, Jespo, uh, thank you for having me, and uh, next time we'll we'll you can ask me even more edgier questions. Uh, I <laughs> I was, to a, was I not edgy enough? I look enough? forward to a conversation. <laughs> I, I thought you were going to ask me some of my, 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 my questions on masks or shutdowns and non-closure of casinos, which hey, I do have a, a, hey, an opinion okay, on. Hey, listen, Grand Chief, I've got uh, – listen. <laughs> hey, man, this is a podcast. We're live streaming on YouTube. We can do whatever the hell we want right now. Uh, let, let me. Do you have five minutes? Do you have five minutes right now? Sam, can you communicate with Dr. Shazma Mathani, who's uh, just uh, obviously the ER doctor uh, at the Royal... I can. Okay, thanks, buddy. Royal Alexandra Hospital, uh, Stollery Children's Hospital. Grand Chief, right now, if I if we were on radio, I'd be stressing because it's 9.04 and, and I haven't read the headlines yet, but right now, all anybody cares about is real talk. All anybody cares about is good conversation. Of course, I should have asked you about casinos not closing. Uh, table games are closed, but the slot <laughs> machines are not closed. What's your take on it? I... Uh, Quite frankly, I 100% support the the premier's decision not to close the gaming um, operations, and, and maybe that sounds too capitalistic or selfish of me, but quite frankly, um, our nation, just like Alberta, has a problem where we're too dependent on that casino. So ultimately, what that results in is uh, non layoff of about 500 individuals, uh, 250 from our nation, and about 250 staff from our our gaming. So you know, 500 person layoff for a 2,500 person community. Um, that is a significant amount of uncertainty. And, uh, you know, I think we've taken steps to mitigate any COVID uh, um, contracting in the, in the gaming uh, space that we have. Uh, we have an excellent operator. So I just 100% support uh, non-closure. I support kind of, kind of some of the, the uh, strategic uh, way the, the provincial government has, has not closed things. Um, Okay, but we, oh, you know, to, 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 to keep it real, when you and I first started our conversation here talking about COVID-19 and its impact on First Nations communities here uh, in Western Canada, most particularly Alberta, you talked about outbreaks uh, and for identifying outbreaks in communities. And then, and then you're also arguing that, for example, casinos shouldn't be closed. I, I, I kind of think it just optically it's weird that they're still open. I understand the business case, and obviously I'm not invested in a casino, but, but to me, the optics of keeping casinos open seems weird. Weird. How do you reconcile the two? The outbreaks on one hand and wanting to keep the business wide open on the other. Really more practical approach. So if we experienced an outbreak in our gaming um, facility, we would close for two or three days and do a deep cleaning and then open right back up. And we haven't seen that. We've taken those steps and measures. Um, Are you confident frankly, in your contact tracing? At Enoch Cree Nation? Yeah. Um, I, I would say we're about as uh, confident as everybody else, which is quite frankly not ever good enough. We should be never be satisfied. But the measures we take to mitigate uh, tracing at the nation uh, at the casino are pretty good. Okay. Uh, finally, let me ask you about masks. You, you asked me to ask you. I can't. You know, I should. You know, geez, I w I went straight to the the sort of esoteric hypothetical stuff. We should have just talked about the stuff on the ground in front of people here. Uh, where do you stand on masks? You know, I. I um, from a nation perspective, uh, you know, it's we have poor enforcement when it comes to masks um, on our nation. You know, I'm not even wearing one right now. And once we step away from this phone call, our, our infrastructure director is right beside me. So I hear him coming in. I'm going to wear this mask. Um, 
I, I do support a mask bylaw. Uh, I guess I'm a little confused on where that lies provincially and who should implement it. Uh, at the end of the day, what I like about masks is that it makes people feel comfortable. Um, so, you know, what's, what's, it's a first world problem to, to, uh, to, to not wear a mask or wear a mask. I mean, if you're, if you're having difficulty wearing a mask, um, that's not something anybody should uh, make a big deal about, in my opinion. Grand Chief Billy Morin, appreciate your real talk, my man. And I look forward to having you back on the show. Thanks for giving us your time. Thanks for letting this go into overtime a little bit. That was great. Yeah, see you again soon, Ryan. Yeah, you bet. Uh, uh, Billy Morin is uh, Grand Chief of Treaty 6 and the youngest elected chief in the history of Enoch Cree Nation. Sam, let's pay a couple of bills real quick. We're grateful that the team at Westworld Computers has joined us on this journey. The studio right now is powered by beautiful machines from Westworld Computers. This is a family-owned business. It has been for more than 40 years. In fact, they celebrated their 40th anniversary just last year. They've had stores open. I, I bought my first iMac at the Westworld in Vancouver, going to university out there. There's the Westworld in Calgary and, of course, the one here in Edmonton. Talk to Daryl and the team. If you're looking for sales or service, they're so proud of their community connection. You can link to Westworld Computers under the sponsors page at ryanjesperson.com. We also wanted to recognize recognize the team uh, that supports us each and every day here at Local Waste. And, and by the way, the submissions that we're receiving every single day to talk at ryanjesperson.com. That's how you can send us an email. The submissions for Trash Talk, which is a sponsored and highly anticipated segment coming up this Friday, brought to you by Local Waste, are blowing our minds. Oh, man, are they ever. Right? Yeah, we are getting so much email to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Sam. Uh, Give uh, us your Trash Talk. This is great. This is great. <laughs> and, and I think because of the way that the week has been unfolding, people are especially fired up. And you go, well, what are the rules for Trash There's no rules. You know, can I say fuck? Yeah, you can say fuck if you want. Uh, okay. You just send us an email to talk at ryanjesperson.com. What do you want to get off your chest? What's pissing you off, quite frankly? And we're going to keep it some days. I'm sure maybe it'll be positive. Maybe it'll be inflammatory. Certainly. And the team at Local Waste is, is proud to present that. Uh, they're a locally owned company. They've been in business for more than 25 years experience going up against the big monoliths, the big international faceless garbage corporations. If you want to learn more about what Local Waste does call Chris or Lauren at 780-242-9746. All right, we've kept her waiting. We so appreciate her availability uh, this morning. Uh, Dr. Shazma Mathani is an emergency room physician at the Royal Alexandra Hospital in Edmonton, as well as the Stollery Children's Hospital. And yesterday, I mean, obviously, she's doing incredibly important work here in the province of Alberta. I'm going to argue that at Shazma Mathani, her Twitter account, she's she's doing incredible work as well in educating the general public and, and giving us a really clear idea of what some of Alberta's physicians are facing and, and really issues that matter to them. Sam, let's go ahead and, and bring in the good doctor. Doctor, thank you. Good morning, and thanks for making time for us today. Welcome to Real Talk. Good morning. Thanks for having me. And I just want to say congratulations on your show. I've been listening all week, and it's been awesome. Oh, thank you. That means a lot. Let me ask you just a personal question. How are you doing right now? Anytime that anybody has an opportunity to talk to a doctor, a nurse, a, hotel, a hospital administrator, a paramedic, they want to know first off, how are you doing? I'm hanging in there. Um, yeah, I guess all things considered, I'm doing well. What are some of the biggest it's challenges? It's been, it's been I'll get out of your way because we have a tiny bit of a delay here. I don't want to step on your toes, but what are some of the biggest challenges that you're facing right now? Uh, I suppose we should probably talk about the emergency room at the Royal Alexandra Hospital. Obviously, the Stollery, probably a bit of a different ball of wax. But for those outside of the Metro Edmonton region, our listeners that are tuned in this morning from Edinburgh and Korea and Vancouver and everywhere else they're chiming in from, they may not know that the Royal Alexandra is, is one of the busiest ERs in Canada. Canada, so without a doubt, the busiest emergency room uh, in the Metro Edmonton region. What does COVID do to that workload, most especially in the midst of another outbreak like Alberta's seeing right now? Yeah, absolutely, Ryan. So the Royal Alexander Hospital, which is where I do my adult emergency work, is the busiest hospital in the city, the busiest emergency department in the city, and it's in the inner city here. And so um, what we've been noticing is that the increase in volume of patients coming in with COVID-19 is certainly affecting the flow and movement of patients through our department. Uh, anytime we have an added stress on our emergency department, it affects how quickly we can bring in even critically ill patients from the waiting room. And so we're noticing just in my shift a couple nights ago, I saw a marked number of COVID-19 patients in my shift, which is not 
that's not been what I've been seeing in the, in the previous two weeks. It's really starting to uh, build up and, and we know that that's going to continue to rise over the next couple of weeks and, and quite concerned on how our emergency department and how the healthcare system in general is going to be able to manage this influx of sick COVID-19 patients. Yeah. So you have, uh, I mean, there are some implications I think that are obvious and, and that is that Alberta's ICU beds could, could uh, be really challenged from, from a capacity standpoint. And we know that some, some surgeries, some scheduled surgeries, most especially elective surgeries are being postponed, but what are some of the, the implications potential or, or, or already manifested implications that some people might not be aware of that you're hyper aware of that you're seeing in the hospital right now? Absolutely. So one example um, is that our waiting room is growing because we can't move patients out of our emergency department. So there's a phenomenon that we call bed block. And what that means is once a patient becomes admitted to hospital, so there's an admitting service that's um, agreed to admit them into hospital, until they have a bed up on the ward, they stay in the emergency department. And so if the hospital is full upstairs um, with either COVID-19 patients or other patients, that means that the patient who needs to move upstairs stays in the emergency department until that bed is available. And that trickles down into the rest of our department. That means that we can't move people out of the waiting room uh, to come into beds because we have no physical space to see them. And so we're already seeing that now. And that's before we're even seeing the effects of this last week of um, the big surgeon COVID-19 patients coming into our hospital in the coming one to two weeks. Um, the other thing that we're really noticing right now is that we're already short on personnel, on nurses, on other staff. So right now we're we're already closing beds. So it's we're not even we haven't even hit the hospitalizations of this big spike in cases, and we're already having to close beds in the emergency department because we don't have enough personnel to staff them. So that's really scary, knowing what's coming in the next couple of weeks. Well, exactly, because it's not like you can just go to uh, you know jobber dot com and and just bring in more physicians, right, or bring in more ER nurses or or surgical attendants. I mean, I mean, you know, when it comes to the well being of physicians, we had uh, ICU doctor Darren Markland join us here just a couple of days ago, and, and he was talking about some of the illnesses that are being experienced by physicians and other healthcare personnel. What Do you feel confident in, in for example, the PPE that's being made available to you? Are, are, are you confident that your colleagues are, are, are experiencing enough rest and, and mental health supports and, and everything else? I mean, take us behind the curtain if you could. So I will say that I, I do feel safe from a PPE standpoint at work. We in the emergency department have um, decided that we're going to treat every patient like they have COVID. So we do the full gown, gloves, eye protection, mask for every single patient that we see. So I do feel safe from that perspective at work. On the mental health side, um, that's a bit of a different story. Uh, we are seeing with the rise in COVID-19 cases that we're seeing, with the rise in just the overall um, acuity of other non-COVID patients that we're seeing, that takes a big toll on us uh, physically, mentally. Um, and as those volumes start to increase in our department, it's it's really hard to have that recovery time between shifts, especially when on the side we're having to also, um, a lot of us are just trying as much as we can to advocate to the public, to advocate to Albertans for the maintenance of our healthcare system. And so even when we're not working on shift, we're still working and trying to fight for our healthcare system. And so it, it's certainly an exhausting time right now. And it, it is hard to recover between those shifts. And that time is really important to do that. And, and um, you know, there are lots of my colleagues that are already feeling burnt out that are on the way to burnout somewhere on the spectrum of that. Do you, um, I think that, that a responsibility that somebody in my position has is, is to not sort of over sensationalize, uh, which is redundant, to not sensationalize uh, data to not to not create some sort of fervor or panic uh, w where there doesn't deserve to be one, but also not to stifle uh, an immediate and impassioned response when when one is demanded. Um, when you take a look at the numbers uh, that we've been hearing from Dr. Dina Hinshaw, you know if we go Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, we're looking at fifteen hundred eighty new cases, fifteen hundred ten new cases, eleven hundred fifty new cases. I mean these these are all ones that have just been identified, right, doctor? These are We don't know yet what these people are going to experience, which means that of the 1,500 on Saturday or of the 1,500 on Sunday, I don't know, 150, 200 could theoretically be hospitalized, 50 could theoretically wind up in the ICU. Uh, with regards to how you're bracing for what could come in two to three weeks, uh, everybody's calling this Alberta lockdown the Alberta mockdown, uh, how are you preparing yourself? How are your colleagues preparing yourself for what could be the reality 
you know, just ahead of Christmas time. So it's interesting that you mentioned that I actually went and crunched the numbers last night. And so from, from, I'm just going to look down on my screen here just so that I can see the numbers, but from November 19th to November 25th, I took all the cases that, um, that had all the new COVID-19 cases every single day for the last seven days, we've had over a thousand cases, which, was, which I was surprised by. And if you use the metrics, um, assuming that Alberta is going to hold true with this number. So three and a half percent are hospitalized. 0.6% go to ICU and about 1% of the, of the patients diagnose, diagnose COVID-19 die. And so based on that last week, this last week of data, the numbers would be 316 in hospital, 52 in ICU, and 88 people dying just from one week, just from this last week of, of case, case loads that we've had. And so we're going to see that in the next seven to 10 days, maybe up to two to three weeks. Um, those are the numbers that are coming to hospital based on the last week of cases alone. And that's just one week. We, we're, we're still going to have a continued increase of cases moving forward. And so those numbers, those numbers are scary for multiple reasons. I, I don't think that we have the capacity to accommodate even like the extra 50 ICU patients. We're already at over 70 ICU um, patients just with COVID-19 alone. We have just shy of 200 ICU beds in the entire province. And so to add another 50 of just COVID-19 patients on top of that, there's no way that we're going to be able to accommodate that. Did you say under um, 200? I thought I thought I heard uh, Premier say on Tuesday that Alberta's uh, ICU beds, I think the, the count was around uh, 650. He portrayed at that time, I think it was the 66 Albertans. Uh, with COVID in ICU is about 10% of the capability. What, what's, is the number 200 closer to accurate? Yeah, so that 650 number is a bit misleading. Um, that is a number that the Premier announced back in the spring, um, saying that, there, that the province had acquired about 600 ventilators, 600 additional ventilators. Um, and that uh, this number of 650 is what's used for this theoretical capacity that we have. Uh, we have to remember that a bed is not a bed without the people to make that bed. And so we might have the physical space, we might have the equipment, but unless you have the doctor, the nursing staff, the respiratory therapists, the cleaning staff, the food staff, the rest of the hospital personnel, that bed and that ventilator don't actually amount into anything because you can't actually put a patient in a bed where there's nobody there to take care of them. And so really the number, the number is, is, is close to 200 is what we physically have right now. Okay, so you have appropriate uh, medical experts. Uh, I'm talking ICU nurses, ICU physicians, et cetera, uh, for about 200 beds. And we have approximately 65 Albertans in ICU just from COVID, which would be approximately a third. We'll call it 35% of Alberta's ICU capacity. People also, I think maybe this is obvious, but sometimes I think we need to spell it out. ICU is also, uh, as, as Dr. Markland's uh, Twitter poll pointed out a, a, a time ago, uh, a mom bleeding out uh, during childbirth or a young person hit in a crosswalk or injured in a motor vehicle crash or somebody that experiences a devastating snowboarding accident or anything. Uh, these are all ICU, right? We don't we, we don't look at this and say, oh, ICUs are only at 35 percent capacity due to covid. So we're cool. Exactly. That's and that's a really good point to make. It's ICUs are not only for covid patients, they're for every other critically ill patient. And so adding an extra 50 patients in a week on top of the already stretched capacity is is going to have profound impacts on our ability to care for these critically ill patients. And so that's a really good point to bring up. It's not just COVID-19 patients. It's everybody that needs an ICU bed that's going to be affected by this. It's everybody that needs an eMERGE visit. It's everybody that needs a hospital bed that is going to be affected by this surge in COVID-19 hospitalizations. We're talking to Dr. Shazma Mathani. She's uh, an emergency room uh, physician, uh, by the way, also an associate professor at the University of Alberta. Out of, uh, she's out of the Royal Alexandra Hospital, the Stollery Children's Hospital. Doctor, I want to ask you about your Twitter thread uh, in just a moment, but I want to break quickly uh, to recognize uh, another one of the teams that are joining us on this journey and keeping Real Talk on the air every single day. We're grateful to have Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge by our side powering this broadcast. You know, it was 10 years ago that I first popped into Sherwood Dodge. The dealership was brand new then, and I talked to Scott, and he set me up with uh, what became my wife and I's first vehicle purchase, uh, 2020, uh, 2010 rather, Jeep Grand Cherokee. Absolutely love it. As a matter of fact, we still have it. 
Uh, yeah, it's got a Hemi. We love that truck. And so when we needed to upgrade, went back to Scott and his team at St. Albert Dodge. And they've got us into a 2020 Jeep Grand Cherokee now. I absolutely love it. It has this snow setting that you can go to. It gives me confidence, not just when I'm driving, but also when my wife has our little guy and our dogs in the back. If you want to experience what it's like to drive a Jeep this winter and worry a little bit less about conditions, go see Scott and his team at St. Albert and Sherwood I'm a, I'm a little jealous. My snow setting is grip the wheel tighter. You're, <laughs> Jesus, take the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> Sam Brooks' strategy of driving in snow, Jesus, take the wheel. Although I know you to be a fastidious and diligent person, Sam. I'm sure you drive the same way, don't you? Uh, y- yeah, in... In in actual truth, I uh, I'm I'm a pretty good winter driver. I put winter tires on my car. Um, I drive a stick shift, so it's it's easy to kind of handle it in some 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 tricky situations. But there you go. Uh, yeah. I'm seeing an opportunity here for a segue uh, because I think if you want to talk about the importance of safe driving and winter tires, an ER physician is probably one of the people you could go to right away. Dr. Shazma Mathani is our guest out of the Royal Alexandra Hospital, the Stollery Children's Hospital. Let me ask you about the measures that were announced by the province uh, by way of Premier Jason Kenney, Health Minister. Ty- Tyler Shandro and Dr. Dina Hinshaw on Tuesday. Uh, I just talked to Grand Chief Billy Morin of Treaty 6, and, and, and he argued that from, from a, more of a business standpoint, not that I, I don't think he was flippant. Uh, it's obvious he cares about his community. Uh, I don't think he was taking a negligent attitude, and people have different opinions, which this is great. We've, we're, we've created a church here for different opinions. Uh, but, Dr., you know, casinos stay open for slot machines. Churches, in theory, whether they're doing it or not, churches in Alberta, I mean, some of them, like I grew up attending First Alliance Church in Calgary. It's a massive congregation. They, under these new rules, can still, in theory, though they say they're not going to do it, they could still welcome 750 people in. Uh, I mean, you had a Twitter thread on this yesterday that really picked up some steam, and I encourage people to read it in its entirety. But what did you make of what some people are calling Alberta's mockdown? I have to say I was really disappointed with the with the restrictions that were put in place on Tuesday evening. Um, aside from a couple of a couple of additional closure of services, it was essentially turning previous recommendations into rules. We know those previous recommendations didn't work given how much uh, COVID-19 cases have continued to spike in the last several days. And I was hoping that the premier and the government would introduce more stringent measures and and close non-essential services so that we could just get a tackle on this. I'm I'm certainly not advocating for a prolonged lockdown. Um, What we need is the ability for our contact tracers and our hospitals to be able to catch up. Otherwise, we are going to become overwhelmed. We already know that contact tracing has now become overwhelmed. It's broken. They're not able to keep up with the surge in cases. And in the next couple of weeks, we're going to see the same thing in the hospitals as well. So what you, you say you're not advocating for a full lockdown, but what, what are some of the things that, that you would have you would have changed immediately? I, I suspect I talked to Alicia Corbella yesterday, widely recognized, I think, as a conservative columnist. And one of the things she said near the end of the interview, she said, you know, she, she touched on, I think, sensitivities around cost and the economic implications of this. She says it doesn't cost anything to put in a province wide mask mandate. She says that's probably where she would have started. What are some of the quick and easy things? Let, let me call them, you know, as, as far as we can tell, non, uh, you know, non-combustible ideas that could have made its way around that cabinet table, non-controversial, generally speaking, uh, that you would have liked to see the government implement. Absolutely. So I would, I would agree with um, Lisa Corbella. I think that a, a province-wide mask mandate is an easy and effective uh, method by which to curb the spread of COVID-19. That's something that the government should be doing. Um, the other thing that stands out, like you had mentioned, is just con- is converting worship services to virtual for a period of time. That is the potential of several hundred people being under one roof together and could be a potential super spreader effect, um, event if there's any breach in, in protocol. And so those are two things that come up. Um, that aren't as controversial as the other things that I would think. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, there are different implications for for schools, uh, obviously with regards to online learning and, and, and from grade seven and up, there are some protocols uh, elementary schools are seeing others. I know you're a mom. How do you feel about how we're treating our school populations and, and, and how we're approaching closures or online learning as opposed to some of the other measures for the general population? This one's really tricky. Um, I mean, the... I, we can't ignore the fact that COVID-19 is spreading in schools. Um, a lot of that likely reflects community transmission. 
Um, I do think that if, if measures had been introduced several weeks ago, we could have avoided moving schools over to online, grade seven to 12 into online, and that um, students could have continued to go to school to see their teachers, to um, see their friends. And, and we know that that's such an important part of the mental health of our youth. Um, I am surprised to see that uh, schools are moving to online. However, things like bars and casinos are continuing to remain open. That part just doesn't really make sense to me. So it sounds like we're putting the, um, the well-being of our students behind the well-being of, of, entertainment, of entertainment of Albertans. And I don't think that's fair. Uh, doctor, in closing, I wanted to get you to clarify in, in layperson's terms, if you if if you could. So, first of all, so I can understand it, and so the majority of our of our viewing audience this morning, watching us stream live on YouTube or, or listening to us live on Mixler, those that will download the podcast later, you're, you're, you're going to be talking uh, to tens of thousands of people right now. And the premier talks about an R uh, of less than one. Um, I, I know that. Uh, you know, we've had had some folks suggest that maybe this isn't adequate. Can, can you explain what that is, how that information should be dissected and, and maybe how you believe the government's approach could be problematic over the next what well, we'll call it now two and a half to three weeks of, the, of this, uh, you know, this this time period under which these conditions are going to apply? Absolutely. So simply the R value is just how quickly the, the rate of growth is of our cases. And so um, I'm not an epidemiologist, so I'll leave it at that. And I think that that hopefully is understandable. And so um, aiming for an R value of, of less than one is, is preventing the exponential growth of the virus. The problem with aiming for, I, I think the premier had said the other night, uh, 0.8. The problem with that is because we already have such high case numbers and such a rapid growth of case numbers right now, that would translate still to 800 to 1,000 cases per day for a period of several weeks. That, that is still too high. Um, you know, just looking at the numbers for the last week that I'd mentioned earlier, about 1,000 cases a day. And the next week, we're going to see over 50 ICU admissions from that. And so having 800 to 1,000 cases a day with an R value of 0 0.8 is simply just too many cases for our healthcare system to be able to accommodate. Um, and I think we should be aiming for a lower number than that and for other endpoints as well. Dr. Shazma Mithani is uh, an emergency physician at Edmonton's Royal Alexandra and Stollery Children's Hospitals, an assistant clinical professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine at the U of A. Uh, thank you so much for, for, for your calm, measured, and might I say accessible expertise. We really appreciate it. On behalf of our audience today, thank you for this. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. We're going to be talking to Julie Rohr coming up in a, a few moments. Uh, she's experiencing uh, COVID, uh, not the infection of COVID, but the pandemic uh, in a way that I know some of you are, but many of us are not. And, and, and that is with a compromised immune system, a so-called pre-existing condition. A statement from a member of parliament really rubbed a lot of people the long. Now, that's too kind. It really pissed a lot of people off a few days ago and julie's going to take us into that plus her, her incredible perspective on life we will be made more rich today having spoken to julie Rohr in just moments right now i wanted to thank the team at the northwest edmonton and sherwood park dairy queens for being a huge part of what we're able to bring you each and every single day there's six of them uh, if you look up you can find baseline dairy queen on twitter you can reach out to their teams if you want to learn more about what they're doing from a local standpoint to ensure that, of course, they're offering you safe and reliable provision of food. It's big for a lot of people that aren't able to cook at home. I know right now, whether you're using your favorite delivery app or you're going through the drive throughs this is a locally owned and operated uh, business. These six Dairy Queen locations, Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park, very proud to be employing local people and providing safe and trustworthy service through this COVID-19 pandemic. We thank them for being a big part of what we're doing here and their ongoing support. If you want to reach out to them, just follow the link under the Sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. Sam, why don't we roll hot into the news headlines in just a moment, and then we're going to get to Julie Rohr. Uh, right now, let's take a look at what's making news on this Thursday morning. Let's hit it. Well, it seems that everybody this morning is talking about a relatively explosive report uh, by CBC investigative reporters Jenny Russell and Charles Rusnell. Secret recordings reveal what are being described as political directives and tension over Alberta's pandemic response. It's certainly this report puts Alberta's chief medical officer of health, Dr. Dina Hinshaw, in a tough position, implying that maybe the government's 
not exactly maintaining realistic expectations from her and maybe not considering the advice that she's giving in a way that a medical professional, a chief medical professional might like. But here's the thing. The release of these secret recordings, not cool, as observed by a number of political commentators. I'm not talking about the fact that Jason Kenney or Tyler Shandro doesn't think this is cool. I'm talking about political strategists that are saying, hey, listen, there needs to be cabinet confidentiality, and this actually hurts the public. I'm looking at Corey Hogan, for example, a well-respected political strategist and commentator in Western Canada. He says this morning, you know, many will cheer access to these secret recordings, but the public servants who did this are not heroes. They have violated their oath. Corey goes on to say they've eroded the ability for public servants to be candid during crisis and they've created mistrust. Corey Hogan says they made government worse. I'm curious for your take on that. If you want to reach out to the show and make sure we're going to see it, tweet at us using the hashtag RealTalkRJ. And Sam's also keeping an eye on the comments thread uh, that unfolds on our live YouTube stream as we're on air every single day. Sam, we also wanted to take a moment to remember an Albertan that I know is dear to many people and the news of his passing has been devastated, uh, devastating for so many, including in Edmonton's hospitality and arts industries. Uh, Ricky Lamb is a was a well-respected and wonderful person. He, just a short time ago, Sam, maybe you can show us his posts on Instagram, had contracted COVID and was telling people about his experience. You can see here his Instagram posts, all the emerg- or at the emergency rather, because my breathing has suddenly gotten worse. Had a lot of symptoms till now, but don't have my test results yet. He then goes on to describe how it began to manifest itself and his symptoms began to get worse. I've been suffering badly, so I couldn't update you. I want to talk about the severe weakness. He says the simplest things are exhausting. Brushing my teeth required me to rest afterward. He then went on to talk about how his breathing was becoming very difficult. Every time I breathe, he says, I go into a coughing fit. Last night's was strong enough to make me vomit. It's so brutal, it doesn't allow me a chance to recover. Well, we're seeing notable Edmonton personalities in the DJ and electronic music scene reflect their devastation. Following Ricky Lamb's passing here, John Hicks, the Oilers DJ, otherwise known as Johnny Infamous, talks about Ricky Lamb as a local rock star, an all-around great guy who came to see him DJ every weekend when he first moved to Edmonton, 40 years young. Johnny goes on to say his life had meaning. He lasted five days. His death was preventable. His last posts are heartbreaking. And Chris Harvey, owner of the Church of John in downtown Edmonton, a well-known DJ as well, sharing his condolences and a very personal expression of grief on his Instagram. Rest in peace, Ricky Lamb. Sam, before we go to Julie Rohr, I wanted to bring up that audio from the priest in Calgary. I know Julie to be a woman of faith, and I want to ask her about this. This is really fascinating video. This is a a faith leader down in Calgary who took to Twitter to argue for the closure of houses of worship. It's about two minutes, and I think it's an important watch. So let's take a look. In a strange situation of imploring our Premier, Premier Kenny, to shut down churches in Alberta. My own church hasn't been open since March. My own diocese has banned public worship for the foreseeable future. But it concerns me that our province is failing to take leadership on this and that some churches are continuing to open. Frankly, it's hard for me to understand why they are. The first and great commandment is to love God and to love your neighbor. And right now, loving your neighbor is staying home, is wearing a mask, is keeping safe. For the case numbers are simply too high. The death toll is heartbreaking. We must turn this around. Today's situation reminds me of Isaiah chapter 58, which you should read. It's a lesson in religious hypocrisy. It starts out with the people all puffed up and proud of themselves for all their outward signs of piety for the worship they do in the temple. And the prophet Isaiah rails against them saying, this is not what God wants. God is not interested in your outward religiosity. God wants you to loose the bonds of injustice, to feed the hungry, to house the homeless, to clothe the naked. 
The prophet goes on to rail against those who trample on the Sabbath day, serving their own interests. And quite frankly for me, those who are going to church right now on Sundays are trampling the Sabbath day, are serving their own interests. Interestingly enough, the first time Jesus gave a sermon in a public place, he unrolled the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And he said that God had sent him to bring good news to the poor. Jesus never told us to go to church. Jesus told us over and over again to love our neighbors. And right now, loving our neighbors <clears throat> means staying home. That, my friends, is true worship. Amen. Powerful message, uh, a sermon in, in two minutes. Uh, from Reverend Anna Greenwood Lee uh, out of uh, St. Lawrence uh, Anglican Church. As we say hello to a a dear friend of mine, and I'm thrilled that she's agreed to make her Real Talk debut this morning, Julie Rohr. If you don't follow her on Twitter, at Julie Rohr, Y-E-G, what are you even doing? Make sure you follow her immediately right now. Julie, welcome to the show. I'm thrilled to have you joining us this morning. Thank you so much, Ryan. It's great to be here. Julie, I, you, you, you are uh, the transparency uh, that you uh, commit to with your social media on Instagram and Twitter is, is nothing short of remarkable. And I'm very much looking forward to this conversation. It, it's through that transparency that many people know that you are a proud woman of faith and, and you're not, uh, in, in my mind, you're, you're one of the believers that I think are, 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 I just have such respect for because you, you force yourself to wrestle with and grapple with issues uh, in and around your faith. What do you make of what you just heard there from Reverend Greenwood Lee with regards to, to congregants gathering in the midst of a pandemic? It's an interesting take she has. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly an interesting take, and I would tend to agree with her that the compassionate thing to do right now for all people of faith is to agree to meet online until our COVID numbers are lower. If we are going to be caring for the vulnerable, the elderly, those who are at risk of contracting COVID-19. Um, I mean, as a person of faith for my whole life, you know, my dad is a pastor. I grew up in the church world and I always heard over and over again about how Jesus cared for the vulnerable. And to me, I mean, what she said about um, churches choosing to meet online is is the compassionate response right now. I do understand how important uh, gatherings of worship are to people and how socially it's very important for our mental health, for our spiritual health, but uh, there are options to do this in a safer way right now until we get our numbers under control. Julie, just to, as a to, to, to pave the foundation, to, to lay the foundation for, for our conversation here, for, for people that aren't familiar with your story, uh, for the past five years and, and, and up to, to now, uh, you've been battling a very rare form of cancer, which obviously has health implications and uh, that I would imagine are exacerbated uh, in a pandemic. For people that aren't familiar uh, with the fight that you're currently uh, taking on, can, can you bring us up to speed so we have a clear understanding of, of what you're dealing with right now? Sure. Yeah, it was uh, just five years ago this week that I was diagnosed with um, leiomyosarcoma. It's a very rare sarcoma that affects about one in a million people. And uh, the median survival rate is about 12 to 18 months. Um, So I was told right from the get go, uh, this is considered incurable by doctors and that I would be very, very lucky to live you know, a few years past diagnosis. Uh, I'm still here. I have been looking for every possible treatment option and I'm not out of the woods by any means. Um, I'm not in remission. I still have lesions on my liver, lungs, etc. So yeah, I'm still in the thick of things, but uh, remain optimistic. What has your experience of, of interacting with the healthcare system through, through the past you know, eight months of, of this pandemic having a, a real and measurable impact on healthcare provision, what has that meant for you? Yeah, it's a very interesting time to be a, a chronic hospital user right now or a healthcare user. Um, interestingly, I was uh, in the hospital in February and March um, dealing with an ulcer that 
uh, gave me some very unexpected problems. I had to go to emergency surgery. So I was recovering from that through February and March. And I basically got released from hospital right as COVID um, came in and, and our lockdown started and stuff like that. So they basically sent me home and said, you'll be safer at home than you might be here. So go now. And um, I mean, all through the whole pandemic, it's been a challenge for me to even go in and get treatment. To It's um, a little nerve wracking to go into public spaces right now as someone with compromised immunity. Uh, I mean, the Cross Cancer and other hospitals are doing a great job with screening and masking and sanitizing and everything. But I mean, I am reliant on the honesty and compassion of other Albertans to be taking those precautions. So, um, you know, I have an appointment this afternoon at the Cross Cancer. Do I want to leave my house? Not really. I'd rather stay here, but uh, I have to go in for this for this appointment. So, yeah, it's been um, it's been a bit challenging, I think, for myself and any other patient that is chronically using the hospital system. You know, you 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 say your your reliance on the on the generosity and the goodwill of your fellow Albertans, and and let me say this. Uh, in cases of, of wildfire or flooding uh, or what have you, the, the generosity and the community support that Albertans have demonstrated is remarkable. Uh, but in a life and death scenario where uh, an infection for you could, quite frankly, uh, just to say it, mean death, uh, I would imagine you'd probably want more than goodwill and expectations of generosity to be in place uh, to protect your health and to ensure your safe travel to and from chemotherapy or whatever other therapies or whatever other appointments you may have. On Tuesday, I know that some business owners, you know, we talked to Mo Blayways yesterday, a bar owner who's, who said that he thought the measures were appropriate. In fact, I got the sense maybe he felt like they went a little too far. And then we talked to other people yesterday that, I mean, you know, Katie Ingram, for example, another hospitality owner said that she thought that people are going to die as a result of the lack of measures uh, announced on Tuesday. What would you have liked to see on Tuesday? I'm, I'm, I'm going to assume that you're going to say you would have liked to see more. Uh, considering your your conversation or your comment around generosity and goodwill, what would you have liked to see that you didn't see? Um, I certainly think the government did not go far enough in their measures, uh, but that's no surprise to anybody who follows me on my social media. I generally tend to lean left in my politics. Um, And what that means for me right now is that um, we are reliant on one another to get through this pandemic. And certainly I don't want to come on the show and say my life matters more than the life of a business owner that has put all of their life savings into their business. My life does not matter more than the teachers that have to go in and teach kids every day. Um, you know, I'm not asking for special considerations. What I'm asking for is for all of us as a whole society to consider how we are operating in this pandemic towards one another as fellow citizens. And, you know, the the truth of the matter is Dr. Raj Bardwash said the other day that over half of Albertans live with um, extenuating circumstances like this, with conditions that pre-existing conditions that include uh, asthma, heart disease, diabetes, things that can be managed on a daily basis, but things that could be a big problem if you contract COVID. So, um, yeah, I would have liked to have seen uh, churches certainly uh, meeting online. I would have liked to see casinos taking a break here. I would have liked to see um, schools take a bit more, you know, have the government shut down schools. But I understand all of that comes at a cost. And these decisions are not easy to make. I mean, I understand that our premier and the entire government is uh, having to weigh all of these hard choices and uh, it's certainly not an easy place to be in. I, th- I think that any elected official at any level of government right now uh, deserves some recognition that the, the decisions that they are uh, considering and the dis- let alone the decisions they're making, this would be an, I, I don't care what, what party you represent. I don't care what level of government uh, at which you serve, uh, this would be an incredibly stressful time. Uh, you know, people were commenting yesterday that, you know, Premier Jason Kenney in a, in a media availability looked 
a little run down, quite frankly. Uh, you know, his, his tie was kind of loosened. He was coughing several times. I mean, you know, keep in mind the Premier had been in self-isolation for a period of time after someone close to him was 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 exposed to or, or had tested positive for COVID-19. And and some people were saying, well, a Premier looks a little bit haggard. And I thought, you know what, man, to, to be, I don't care what, what party you represent, what province we're talking about, to be the Premier uh, or the Prime Minister, or a, or for that matter, a Chief Medical Officer of Health, at a time like this, Julie, I can't imagine. I mean, the implications, you know, some people saying y- you should just shut down houses of hospitality, or, you you know, a- a- and other people saying uh, we will literally, my family will literally lose everything, right? Our house is up on this. We've, we've, we've taken out a second mortgage. We've dipped into our savings. Our RSPs are gone. I just it's nothing to me about this is a simple or uh, there are some obvious decisions. You know, I think keeping distance, I think wearing masks to me, these are obvious. Uh, I think it shows respect to other people. I think it shows a willingness to get on board, quite frankly, if nothing else. Uh, We're trying to do that as a show here with the plexiglass and all the other measures we've taken because we want to set an example. But it would be far from easy I think regardless of the party you represent or the policy you push out right now, and I think that needs to be said. A hundred percent. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a person who is um, very compassionate and as angry as I am about UCP policies from before the pandemic, I am not a fan of pretty much most of their policies that have been enacted since they came into office. I do understand these are human beings who are struggling through their own personal feelings, their own personal fears during this, um, and the absolute ramifications of these decisions. They are very big ramifications. And I mean, I'm looking at places like Australia, where government did some pretty severe lockdown stuff. And uh, as a result, there were many businesses that closed and many jobs that were lost. Um, But they brought their COVID numbers down to zero. And I mean, it's, um, to me, it's kind of like, would you rather lose your business or lose your brother? I mean, if you had to think about it like that, really, we're talking about human lives. And what I'm really passionate about is putting a face to the concept of someone who is vulnerable. Because if you would see me walking down the street, you would not think I look vulnerable or that I might be susceptible to death from COVID. But the reality of my situation and the reality of so many Albertan situations is that we are in a precarious place in terms of our very lives. And so um, I understand these measures are difficult to enact, but I think that our government needs to have a little bit more courage to do the right thing for everybody. And that, um, and there are some things that I think would have been easy wins in terms of uh, a lockdown for a period of time. We're kind of past that period of time now where, businesses could have been open before Christmas and, you know, brought in that pre-Christmas income, but we kind of missed that boat to lock down, um, you know, in time for that. So it's tricky. You, this is kind of a weird thing for me to say to you, but, but, but I'll say it cause you just said it. You don't look like a cancer patient. And I, and I think what, what most people will understand what I'm getting at is you're, you know, you, you look very healthy. You have your hair right now. These are the types of things. And, and the point I'm getting at is we don't know as we anecdotally survey those around us, as we're walking down the sidewalk, as, as we're, you know, whatever we're doing is we're in our vehicles looking around at a red light. Uh, for those of us that aren't on our phones at the red lights, I, but I digress. Um, we don't know what people's health circumstances are. We don't know what make, might make somebody vulnerable. Uh, Rachel Harder, a, a member of parliament, conservative member of parliament, had posted, uh, I think about five days ago now, uh, and I want to read this and I want to get you to respond because it really lit a fire under you uh, by way of your Twitter account, Julie, uh, says Rachel Harder, the member of parliament, 10. That's the number of otherwise healthy people who have died from COVID-19 in Alberta since the beginning of the pandemic, 10. This may come as a surprise to people both in Alberta and around the country who are following the second wave of COVID-19 as it sends daily case counts rising in many Canadian provinces. One gets the sense that things are much worse. I have words for it, but what are your words for it? Well, so first of all, um, 
Rachel Harder was quoting a uh, the author of the article in the Toronto Sun when she said those things and um, or when she shared that article. And uh, for me, I think it's up to elected officials to be very responsible with what they share and what they say online because their words have maybe more weight to them than the average person because they're in a position of being an elected official. Um, and, you know, I'm not the kind of person that feels sorry for myself by any means. I'm not a victim of anything, not of the pandemic, not of the cancer diagnosis, but I am a compassionate advocate for those who have to live with disease or disability or um, anything that might put them in a precarious situation. And those words to me seem very callous, seemed very not compassionate. To say that only 10 healthy people in Alberta have died from COVID. I mean, we have 500 deaths as of what, yesterday, something like that, we passed the 500 mark. So to, to say like, you know, 490 of those deaths don't matter, is that what she's saying by sharing the article? I mean, it just seems very not compassionate to basically discount the deaths of people who have extenuating circumstances, who have health conditions, who have pre-existing conditions. I mean, I'm a 38 year old woman, I've got, um, a son who's 11, a stepson who's 14. I have a lot of life left to live, um, however much I have left to live. Do you know what I mean? And there's other people like me who are in that boat where um, our health is, is here and COVID would make it die. So we're living beautiful, good, full, rich lives. We're not like wasting away, you know, somewhere. We're, we're, we're living, we're alive. And um, to kind of discount our lives by saying you know only 10 healthy people have died well what's healthy really like well, I'm it, it, well, let, very let me, healthy life right let, you, you know what the first thing i thought of when i read it um because I, I read it a couple times to go she's sharing like, like i just kind of thought from a member of parliament it, it's it's insane to share that and to push that idea out but i thought julie you know what if we if we took covid uh, or if the author of that editorial or if that member of parliament took covid as seriously as we take peanuts uh then i think that we you know can you imagine if i sent as as a dad new to the school system our little guy he's learning from home right now he's, he's just starting kindergarten but we're hoping he'll be in school for grade one can you imagine if i sent him to school with a big bag of peanuts and a peanut butter sandwich and a whole bunch of you know other sort of nut allergy inducing accelerants and i said to the principal as parents around me became outraged because i I've, I'm, I've, I've just learned in the last little while how seriously people take peanut allergies and they should uh well i mean that's a whole other show but uh can you imagine if i said to the principal excuse me principal exactly zero otherwise healthy kids have died from peanuts in schools so I'm going to keep bringing peanuts to schools. Can you imagine? Yeah, that's a, that is an interesting example. And I hadn't thought of it that way, but that's, I mean, it's, um, it's a strange time we're living in Ryan. And I think what we're dealing with is that generally in society, we take turns being vulnerable. So, you know, your neighbor's um, parent passes away, your friend is diagnosed with cancer, your other friend has a baby. We take turns helping one another through these life events. But right now what's happening with COVID is that we're all vulnerable at the same time. And so people are driven by fear in their policymaking, in the way they follow or do not follow rules, in the way we're treating one another just in general online or out in the stores or streets, whatever, we are operating at a level that's very fearful. And I mean, I understand fear of mortality. I've had to face my own mortality for five years. It's um, not a comfortable feeling. And what happens when people feel uncomfortable is they do anything to try and regain control of that feeling of chaos. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so right now what we're seeing in Alberta is these, it's really divisive. It's very divided between people who are saying, well, don't trample on my rights. I don't have to wear a mask if I don't want to. And people who are saying, my very life depends upon you wearing a mask like could you just do me the courtesy and you know both sides are operating out of a place of you know fear for their own circumstances and I think if we all look into one another uh, into ourselves if we all have the self-awareness to realize a lot of our reactions right now are being driven by fear 
and try and dial back a little bit and, and figure out what's the responsible, compassionate way to move forward as a society, I think we'd be better off. Julie, one of my uh, things I learned early in my career uh, with w when you get to longer form interviews, you always need to make sure that you ask the interview subject, is there anything I might not think of? Is there anything you'd like to talk about? Are there any resources that we can put in front of you to make sure that this interview has the impact that we hope it will? And I'm very intrigued to know why you wanted to. Well, I, I know why a lot of people want to talk about the living wall. Uh, down on the Alberta legislature grounds, I'm I'm laughing so I don't cry uh, because this is a wall. I know that's you know the, the government has said it requires about seventy thousand dollars in maintenance every year. Sam, can you show us what we're talking about here? Look at this. Now, this was part of of a big seven figure HVAC improvement. Okay, so the seventy thousand dollar number is a little bit misleading. It was it was it was installed this incredible masterpiece. 10 years ago under a conservative government at government house and this government, uh, Sam, if you want to show us, I, I hate that this image is going to make me just cringe. Uh, this is the living wall yesterday. Uh, it's been taken down. It's been politicized. Uh, Julie, it makes me so sad. If for no other reason that we couldn't rehome, rehouse the plants. I know I sound full blown hippie right now, but uh, why did you want to talk about the living wall? Well, I brought up the living wall. Um, you know, with some friends, I've been talking about it this week, and a friend of mine mentioned to me, it's kind of a metaphor for the UCP government in Alberta. I mean, having this beautiful thing that is giving life, that is cleaning the air in the building, that is essentially actually part of the HVAC system in that entire building. It was designed around that living wall, around those plants. And for our government to look at it and say, oh, it's too expensive to upkeep, when, when in reality, the person who installed the wall, a representative for that company said, well, we could have decreased those costs if the government just approached us and said, hey, let's reduce the amount of times we're, we're um, maintaining the wall. We could have reduced the costs by, you know, he said like almost three quarters. And so now the government's going to have to actually retrofit the whole thing and it might cost seven figures to redo that. So how are we saving money by tearing down this gorgeous piece of infrastructure that was designed to be forward thinking, that was designed to be helpful and beautiful. And, you know, I feel like in so many ways, the UCP government is tearing down things that are forward thinking in our province just for ideological reasons that make absolutely no sense when you really crunch the numbers and when you look at it. And it, it breaks my heart, really. It, it does break my heart. And I really wish that they would take more care and consideration into those kind of things and not spend so much money, you know, $30 million on a war room that has only brought us ridicule as a province, really. It's, just, it's done nothing but be a ridicule, like our tracing app, like the Alberta tracing app. Come on. Like, it's ridiculous how much we're paying for that. And it doesn't even work. So it's just a, it's a metaphor to me. The tearing down of the living wall is um, just a visual of what our government is actually doing to this province. And it's uh, it's disheartening. She is the formidable Julie Rohr. And you can follow her on Twitter at Julie Rohr, Y-E-G. I can't wait for your next appearance here on the show. I'd love to have you on a roundtable, Julie. Uh, we've had an opportunity to to see you tango in past with people of different political perspectives. And and the approach that you take to sharing ideas and considering other points of view is, is nothing shy of refreshing. Uh, when you get off this interview, when you get out of this commitment uh, and you start scrolling your Twitter timeline, you'll see what people are saying about this appearance here on Real Talk. I'm very grateful. Wish you good health. And I can't wait to see you again soon. Thank you for joining us, Julie. Thank you so much, Ryan. Have a great day. Yeah, you bet. So every morning uh, I send out from my Twitter account at Ryan Jesperson, the guest lineup. Uh, and if they have Twitter accounts, if they're on Twitter, uh, that's where you can follow them. It's been funny to hear from people. I, I think it was Trevor yesterday that reached out to me that that said, uh, I, I came here and I signed up for Twitter just to talk to you on Real Talk. And I said, that is a beautiful thing because because really what we're all doing here or many of us anyway, is changing our habits, right? You're changing your habits on, on how you find talk radio by checking out Ryan Jesperson every morning and joining us, subscribing to our YouTube channel. You're, you're subscribing to podcasts. Maybe you've never done that before. You're learning about Patreon, how you can support a show like this and help us hire more people, including more journalists, another in-studio producer. Sam Brooks at some point is going to ask for a day off and, and I don't know what we're going to do when he does that. 
but you're changing your habits along with us, and it means a lot. Uh, Sam, why don't we give a shout out right now to the amazing team at Friesen Brothers? Uh, Friesen Brothers about to open their 15th location in Alberta. It's a beautiful store in South Edmonton, just off a Rabbit Hill Road. I had a chance to tour it the other day. They're getting set to open, and this spring it is going to change. Let me tell you, it's not. They're not really grocery stores. They've reinvented it uh, over the 60 plus years that they've been in business in Alberta including our two favorite shops in Stony Plain and Fort Saskatchewan. Well, here's the thing with Friesen Brothers. They employ a team of Red Seal chefs. And with Christmas approaching, we know that it's going to look a little bit different for you this year. You, you may have a, well, you may have a gathering of two around your table. Maybe you're a family of six or seven or eight, and you'd like to leave the cooking to somebody else so you can actually take in what will be a very memorable and unique holiday celebration. Friesen Brothers team of Red Seal chefs has all the turkey you need, the Alberta-grown produce, their famous sourdough bread, and all the ingredients. If you're opening up maybe maybe Grandma's traditional holiday treat, you need the best ingredients in the business, you'll find it at Friesen Brothers, Alberta-grown, Alberta-owned. Sam, I know that you've had a, a lot uh, on your plate this morning from a technical standpoint. Have you had a chance to take a look at this investigative report, pretty explosive, uh, that was pushed out by the CBC, Jenny Russell, Charles Rusnell, the, their their uh, intrepid team of investigative reporters around these leaked audio tapes? Have, have you had a chance? Yeah, I was actually listening to, uh, like, on my on my short drive to work here, because I, I live, like, less than five minutes from the studio, I uh, was listening to Jenny Russell to give some commentary at, and, and play some of the audio of it on, on on the radio this morning so it's uh it's i mean it's i think it's not surprising to a lot of albertans but it's a bombshell nevertheless yeah here's here's what, what i'm finding really interesting and and by the way i want to thank uh the viewers and the listeners it's 1002 now but uh, we don't care by the way right i think we're realizing quickly the show needs to be a little bit longer uh <laughs> we launched from 8 30 to 10 because i thought 90 minutes with no breaks uh we don't break for i mean we, we read you some advertising spots we're grateful to have our partners when but you told me this was going to be a 90 minute show i was like i, I think we can fill 90 90 minutes of yeah, air yeah, time yeah, and, and now i'm no i entirely agree it like, is not long enough so like now we're just getting started yeah <laughs> we're just getting <laughs> right we talked to grand chief morin and dr Mathani and julie roar and now we're just ready to get started uh so we're going to go a few minutes into overtime here so we can read your comments uh, a lot of you are chiming in on this but here's the cole's notes of the story and again you can read it all at cbc.ca that's another cool thing now is 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 i can find great reporting and journalism from everybody and share it with you right when you're when you're under the employee oh, yeah, of go a ahead. Big, when you're under the employee of a big powerful corporation uh if i were to on for example let's say a a, a chorus owned radio station push out big stories done by the cbc i would have my knuckles wrapped before you could I mean, before you could shake a finger at me now with a show like this, we're able to talk to journalists. We're able to report on stories across the spectrum, including, by the way, and for the first time, I want to tease what's coming up. The Real Talk Roundtable on Friday from nine to ten. The Real Talk Roundtable that's coming up tomorrow will celebrate highlight, showcase, and platform the work done by three different independent media outlets. That's going to be tomorrow from 9 to 10 on the show. But but what were you going to say? I didn't mean to step on your toes there, Sam. That's your show, dude. Uh, what I was going to say is, you know, I love this freedom because, and it's the same reason I don't like paywalls on, on news organizations. I think journalists should be paid. I think that it's an important industry. Being, I mean, we both work in that industry, so there's, there's, there's no convincing me of, of the importance of it. But I also know that you know, when we're taught to be smart news consumers, we're taught to go to a variety of sources. And when you're handcuffed to only looking at one news source, I think you're doing your listeners a disservice by not looking elsewhere. I totally agree with you. Now, now ultimately, uh, Real Talk will be pushing out our own journalism. I mean, what we do here every single day with these live interviews is journalism, right? We're asking questions that matter of people in positions of power, authority, influence, expertise. That qualifies as journalism. But we ultimately will be building, uh, we are building a team here. We have built a team here. The team will continue to grow. And if you want to support us, uh, there's many ways you can do that. I'm not going to keep pumping our tires here, but I just, you know, Many of you are sending me emails, and by the way, you 
can email me directly at ryan at ryanjesperson.com. I know our web team is going to say, oh boy, here we go. We're going to get, you can get me directly if you want, or you can go to talk at ryanjesperson.com, which ensures that Sam will also see it. Uh, yes, so I always get all the things to talk. It'll be on our radar so that if I miss anything, Sam's got it there. But but people are reaching out and saying, how can we support you? Explain to us how we can support you. So here's what you can do. Number one, you can tell everybody that every morning at 830, you are live streaming Real Talk. Number one, tell everybody you know. Tell them where to find it at ryanjesperson.com. Subscribe to us on YouTube and ring the bell. That's really important. Subscribe to us by way of your favorite podcast app, whether you're on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or any of the other platforms that I had never heard of before. Sam knows all about them, as does Mike Johnson, who does an amazing job as part of our uh, web. He's our web quarterback, basically. Um, You can subscribe to our podcast, listen to them, rate the podcast, comment on the podcast, and share it. And ultimately, if you really want to See this show grow quickly and in meaningful fashion. You can consider a monthly commitment by way of our Patreon account, and we've linked to that again at ryanjesperson.com. So here's the Coles notes on that CBC story. Uh, Jenny Russell, Charles Rosnell, pushing this out about six hours ago. Basically, secret recordings reveal what they call political directives and tension over Alberta's pandemic response. here's, Here's The Coles notes are that Dr. Dina Hinshaw is maybe being uh, tasked with something impossible. Uh, The Premier and the Minister of Health allegedly, according to these audio recordings, are looking for information before making decisions that really isn't reasonable, reliable, or even possible to acquire. And it paints a picture of division between Alberta's chief medical professional and Alberta's Ministry of Health and Premier's office. So how do you feel about it? I mean, on one hand, what does it do to your confidence in the in, in the process? But on the other hand, how do you feel about the leak? Right. I read you what Corey Hogan had to say earlier this morning. I appreciate when we have politicians and former politicians chiming in. Everybody east of Edmonton and in Edmonton as well knows who Carla Howitt is. Carla, a personal friend of mine, has has served a public servant and elected official. As she says, listen, reaches out to the show. She says confidential conversations must be kept confidential. Otherwise, those involved are never free to have open conversations and good decisions become harder. Meantime, on Twitter, the burly chef is watching us this morning. Good morning to you, chef. He says, Ryan, I could care less about the politics of this. He says, you know, pundits will say the recordings shouldn't be leaked, but Albertans like myself, for example, will say the shocking aspect is that we have politicians not listening to experts during a pandemic, says the burly chef. That is not cool. Now, Ash B is listening in. Ash B, thanks for tuning in to Real Talk this morning, says, you know, I, I would agree with Corey Hogan if the United Conservatives hadn't already proven themselves to be dishonest and created mistrust when it comes to Albertans. Ash says desperate people take desperate measures. We need information and transparency, and we're not getting it from this government. So a lot of different perspectives, Sam, which which is interesting to me on, uh, I mean, number one, there's the story. And some people will find that a leak is important because it puts a story in front of the general public. Others will suggest that this is going to make it really difficult, not just for conversations, for example, you know, with the premier and experts or ministers and experts or deputy ministers and experts, but also for the public servants that are that are simply involved every day in governance, in, in, in the mechanism that is operating this province and making and monitoring those important decisions. Yeah, I uh, I think that there's a um, there's definitely I think I'm, I'm personally a little bit more in that camp of. You know, there's there are many times when governments and, and government operations need that confidentiality to make decisions, and, and I buy into that 100%. I think that that's, you know, that's, that's a normal time sort of circumstance, but, you know, desperate people go to desperate situations, and I think that that's exactly what's happening. The fact is we have seen such a vacuum of leadership on this file that people are taking matters into their own hands, and, you know, rather than getting their backs up against the wall that this leaked because right now the government is embarrassed that their views from you know how they're dealing with the COVID situation is is getting out there and is confirming a lot of people's suspicions I think that you know ultimately the government works for us and we elected them and we pay the bills for them to go in there and make policy every day and if there is compelling evidence that they are not listening to our talk expert or top expert rather we need to address that i agree 
Uh, we want to uh, wrap today's show with a couple of shouts out to uh, to sponsors of ours that are doing uh, everything possible, everything we've asked of them and more, Sam, to make sure that we're able to be here every day and give you a great show. And that includes the team at Clean Air Club. If you haven't heard of Clean Air Club, they're a local business serving the Edmonton region. Uh, when it comes to furnace filters, when's the last time you changed yours? Uh, some of you are going to go, last week last week and you're going to feel good about yourself because you should but most of us have a really tough time keeping track of that Uh, when it comes to clean air club you don't even have to think about it you log on to cleanairclub.ca you choose your filter your size your delivery frequency and then uh well they handle the rest and here's the thing as a local business they also include a little surprise with every delivery promoting another local business they love which is really cool you have to wait and see what it is and they also our proud partners sponsoring Asthma Canada. So if clean air doesn't resonate with you now, when's it going to? Check out cleanairclub.ca. And our final shout out today is to the team at Todd's Mechanical. You know, I've been a big fan of this guy. I've been telling you this ever since my first phone call with Todd. The, the guy is like, you know, when you people are running big businesses, I think sometimes they have the 10,000 foot view and they have all these employees and everybody's a number. That's not the case at Todd's Mechanical. This guy had a career in the oil field, knows what he's doing, turning wrenches, solving problems. He wanted family stability. He wanted career stability, so he moved back into the city, and now he's recognized as the best plumber in Edmonton. Keeps you warm and dry, and he's going to bail you out when your furnace conks out when it's minus 25. Why not have that furnace that's kind of coughing and sputtering now? Get it up to speed before it's frigid. And give Todd's Mechanical a call at 780-499-7598. You can find more on all of our sponsors or inquire about sponsorship at ryanjesperson.com. I want to wrap with this, Sam. How about this? A tweet from Patrick Wu. Uh, Patrick, it's amazing to have you tuned in this morning, and I thank you for this tweet. He says, you know, it's not even been a week, but I think that Real Talk is a good motivator for me to wake up earlier in the mornings. So, Patrick, we're going to take that as a verbal contract. We'll see you and everybody else here tomorrow at 8.30 Mountain Time as we go live with another episode of Real Talk. Senator Paula Simons and the first ever Real Talk Roundtable. Have a wonderful Thursday, and we'll talk to you soon.